The Eye of the Tiger, the title song of the motion picture in Rocky III, was a pean to surviving, going the distance, and winning. Our focus today, however, is on the eyes of a global investor who wins by scouring burly neighborhoods in search of hidden gems. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new season of Wizards. I'm your friendly host, Ramesh Damani. A linguist, a CFA, a globetrotter, a value seeker, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the CEO and co-CIO of Ronjur Global Investors, Laura Gerritz. Laura, welcome to our show. Thank you, Mr. Damani. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us at 6 a.m. in uh, uh, Salt Lake. Thank <laughs> you so much for being so sporty. Uh, Laura, in a recent interview, you said that capital grows better, it compounds better in friendlier climates. Where in emerging markets do you find friendliness now as a global investor? Well, you know, it's generally speaking places that are partnered with um, countries that are, you know, where the supply chains are shifting. So could be Mexico, um, Brazil, uh, India, Southeast Asia. I think uh, one place you find investments is also places that have, uh, that have faced inflation head on. So lots of places actually. So Laura, if I gave you a hundred million dollar check in your fund, uh, and I told you, choose between China and India, only one country, which would it be? Well, I'm a long-term investor, so I'd have to say India. Uh, we always say, you know, you want to be careful of countries where uh, the, uh, you know, the capital can be, uh, belong to the government and not to the shareholder. And so we're, we're cautious of China over the long term. Uh, the market's gotten very cheap, though. So over the short run, Ch China might be a good opportunity. You made a lot of fans in India by picking India, but you have said that China uh, inflation rate is going down, interest rates are stable in China, uh, and valuations are clearly at a knockdown level. So as a, on a purely fundamental basis, uh, how does India stack over China then? I, I like the long run potential of India so much better. I mean, if you look at it, just from our process perspective, if you, when you screen bottom up and look at companies, India is just full of such fantastic companies. And, you know, I think if you look at the potential for compounding your capital because of regulation changes, because of just supply chain changes, uh, India offers great potential. What is attractive about China, uh, which, uh, you know, we, we wait for these chances a lot in our investing careers, is that some very high quality companies have gotten inexpensive because the, uh, you know, the, the you know, China is just the view of China is just so negative right now. Let me ask you another way. When the Berlin Wall fell, the world globalized, and China was a great beneficiary before because it entered the WTO. Now with the world deglobalizing, how does the prospects of India stack up? And what are the themes? How do you play deglobalization if you believe that is going to be a force? Yeah, you know, it's it's really simply categorized into a few bu buckets, reshoring, multi-shoring, onshoring, and friendshoring. And you play it through, you know, you play it through India, you play it through Mexico, you play it through uh, Latin America, Southeast Asia, Vietnam. So it's, it's a very uh, di different set of countries than I think what a lot of investors have been used to over the last, you know, 10 or 12 years. Let me pick your brains on that. You said reshoring, friend shoring, close shoring. So it's basically what we call in India an India plus one, uh, China plus one strategy. We call it NAFTA. Uh, you know, as as Americans, we call it NAFTA plus Southeast Asia plus India. Uh, so or, or, and you know Latin America. So it's a it's a very similar way of looking at the world. NAFTA has become a bad word in America itself. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's better than, I guess it's better than some of the alternatives over the last few years. But, but Laura, is there really an alternative to globalization? I mean, the pendulum might swing a little bit towards deglobalization, but, you know, businesses will go where costs are lowest, aren't, won't they? I, I, yes, they will. So, uh, I, I, I mean, that just opens up diff different opportunities, I would say, than the last than what we've seen over the last 10 to 12 years. But I, I agree with you. I mean, you know, people, American businesses are still going to choose places where manufacturing is inexpensive. So I just think it's a movement of the supply chain. 
there's some reshoring, but a lot of it is, you know, multi-shoring and nearshoring. So lessening your risk on one country. Which of course plays to India's strengths because it is a large country with a lot of uh, talented people. You can get 5,000 software engineers, 5,000 chemical engineers in one go. Yes, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing economy and country. You know, a lot of the world is your oyster. I mean, you can pick stocks anywhere you want in the world. But how do you begin the process of narrowing down the stocks? How do you decide this is my investable list? It's an iterative process for us. I mean, we start with screens. We have our own proprietary screen. Uh, we, we've literally, you know, there are 70,000 plus companies in the world. Um, you, we can literally plug a company into this uh, screen. We can do a thousand at once. Uh, go through uh, each co country or company, you know, it's a 15 year snapshot of the income statement, balance sheet and cash flow statement of the company. And you can narrow down the world, you know, into a set of you know, three to 500 companies pretty easily through the screening process. Uh, and then you take the next steps in your analysis, which is discovering whether the business has a moat. For us, I, I mean, our team is 20 plus years of experience, uh, you know, collaboratively. Uh, each of us. And so we've, we've seen these companies many times between uh, the team. So just an iterative process, but I mean, quality is quality and it doesn't, it tends to have long duration. It doesn't tend to change. What changes is the macro environment around it, the company. So if I hear you right, you're uh, more or less country agnostic. Uh, you're focusing more on bottom up stock picking. Y yes. So we do think about, you know, what is the right price to pay for a company in a country and how good will that country be for the compounding of capital in the future? It has to be friendly in compounding terms, as you said. Uh, Laura, maybe over the last, uh, putting it, you know, maybe over the last few years in particular, uh, getting the field right has been uh, increasingly important. It has. But uh, let me, uh, you have a proprietary formula that you talk about called CGP. Can you explain what they stand for and give it some color? Tell me how you find companies in India using that. It's very simple. So we start with the numbers and then we look and we, we look and say, this, okay, this is what happened with the business in the past, but we really want to know what's going to happen with the business in the future. So what we do is we, it's called Club Blue Platform. Uh, it's very simple. It's a nine point scoring system. And what you're doing is you're looking at a business on three different facets. So you're looking to see, you know, it is this business a club? And, and what we mean by that is, does it does it dominate something? Is it a low cost leader of a product? Um, you know, really simple businesses like, uh, you know, the the delivery company Blue Dart that it dominates last mile. That's you know, that's a it's a club. You know, it's, it's a club. Uh, it's, it's a club. And then you look at Glue. How sticky is this product? I mean, Nestle India Asian Paints. But those, you know, those are products that people need. They buy frequently. Um, you know, whenever I go to India, I think, oh, geez, I think you just have to look around you and see that the potential for paint uh, is extraordinary. Uh, and then the last uh, facet of that is called platform. And again, this is uh, not just a, an e-commerce network. This is also distribution network. And I think Asian Paints is another example of a company with a phenomenal distribution network. Um, anybody can do this process. Uh, you know, it's it's very simple. And and the golden mean for you is to find uh, uh, companies in the crux of the CGP formula, as you call it, right? You want at least two. So you want to have a club, and uh, you know you want it to be a club and a platform, or a club and a glue. Uh, if you get uh, if you only get one attribute, chances are you're going to get the stock wrong. I, in this whole process, I always, I learned that, you know, my biggest mistake was buying companies, paying too high a price for companies where the product wasn't sticky enough. So this process helps, helps you get better at your own mistakes too, and become a better investor. But uh, Laura, as you go through your CGP formula, particularly say in a market like India, which I'm familiar with, a lot of the great companies you talked about also are not cheap. Nestle is not cheap. Asian Paints is not cheap. Probably will never get cheap. So how do you construct price? I mean, how do you determine what price is appropriate? We, we're patient. You know, the one beautiful thing about the Indian market is it's broad. It's a broad, deep market. And so 
there's always opportunities in the market. It might not be Asian Kings today or Nestle India, it may, may be something else. But you know, you wait patiently, you have your list of companies you want to buy, uh, and you just wait for some sort of opportunity, uh, you know, they, or something that gives you that opportunity to buy them. We actually, India is one of the rare markets, emerging markets allow you to do this, where you can build what we call umbrella valuations. So we look at, for instance, we look at a business in the US and we say, well, this is how big it got in the US over time. And we can apply that to, well, I mean, the penetration rates in India are so low, you can apply it to almost any uh, business in India uh, with a good management team and just kind of let it do its compounding over time. If we look at uh, PEs, they look high today, but if we look at market cap versus the potential size of the economy, uh, the companies still have a lot of potential to just grow and compound through the years. That's a great way. Don't look at the near-term earnings or the price earnings ratio, but look at the market cap to the size of the opportunity. Very tiny. I mean, look at Blue Dart, we mentioned it earlier. Look, look at it versus it's, you know, it has a, a, a company, you know, you look at, uh, you know, the delivery companies. FedEx or States, UPS. Colorado. Yeah, exactly. It's a tiny company today in India. Huge potential. Laura, please hang around a little bit more. We'll take a quick commercial break and see you on the other side. And a very warm welcome back to the Wizards of the Street. We are in conversation with Laura Gerritz, CEO and co-CIO, Ronjur Global Investors. Laura, can you give me an example of historically, which stock are you very proud that you picked in India and you got it right? And what was what attracted you to that stock? Well, I found that if I stick to my knitting of buying good companies when they go out of favor, you do very well. I so I've. Of course, I'm at a new firm today, but we, I was invested in India decades ago. So we bought, you know, Asian Paints when it was a small, small cap company. So I look back at that, and you know, when I started my new firm, I bought it again, uh, and you know, pretty much reassembled the same portfolio I had, and I've just held on. So, you know, I I would point to that as one of my best buys, though. Uh, you know, buying that as a small, small cap company and just holding it. It's been a great stock. It's still a compounder. But, you know, I have to ask you this because I know you're from Kansas and in The Wizard of Oz, there's a very famous dialogue that says, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. When you go to emerging markets, uh, do you get the same sense of feeling? And why do you persist with emerging markets when you're one jet, you know, 30 minutes away from Silicon Valley? Well, you know, it's because I grew up in Kansas, uh, you know, that I always, you know, when you're in Kansas, you pick up a book, you imagine places all over the world. My parents, uh, you know, passed their passion for the world uh, and their imagination and creativity onto me. So I think it was because I was in Kansas and I was literally in tornado country in Kansas that, you know, I wanted to, to see the world. And you started in uh, Japan? I first, I've been to Europe before, but I had started, yes, by teaching English in Japan, studying the Japanese language. So that was quite an interesting experience for a fund manager. How did that experience shape you? I mean, did it help you? Uh, did it give you some better insights that you normally would not have had, you thought? I think, you know, I'm sensitive to cultures. I mean, the nuances of language are really important. I, I don't know if you know in Japan, but, uh, you know, uh, probably, I will try means no, probably means no, maybe means no, yes can mean no, and no definitely means no. So, I mean, there's the nuances of language and culture matter in investing. And, uh, that, that's the, the nuances that you use. But something that's not nuanced right now is, you know, the Fed has been raising rates. It has been raising rates since March. Uh, how long does it, uh, generally, whenever the Fed raises rates, there's a disaster waiting to happen. Mexico, Brady Bonds, Caribbean. We've seen some early signs of that in surprising places. Uh, how long does it take to work its way through the economy, these rising rates, and how scared are you of that? 12 to 18 months, generally how long it takes to work through the economy. I mean, just this has been a different cycle because it's because of COVID lockdowns and reopening and monetary and fiscal stimulus, 
I feel like you have different cycles all over the world. Uh, and you've had, you know, the cycle has been more like a tsunami than a wave uh, this time. So uh, I think people still don't understand that demand actually needs to be destroyed to bring inflation down in the United States. So it's going to be a tough year for earnings uh, in, in the world's biggest economy next year, I think. So what is your current mantra? You say buy the dips or you say sell the risk on rally? We're, we're, until the mentality of buy the dip dies, we are still selling the rally. We're still saying, you know, with a, a, a portfolio that's more heavily tilted to consumer staples uh, and uh, less cyclical businesses. But I mean, because of COVID, it's it's really, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really a, a a great invest time frame to actually be looking at companies as opposed to just one cycle globally. It's just, it's many cycles going on all over the world. Uh, Laura, what is the cycle in India that you're looking at now? You look out two, three years down the road. What is it about this market that excites you or which sectors excite you? Can you give us some color on that? You know, it was the only country in the world where there were expensive stocks where we didn't sell or, or take profit. And the reason is, is because I really believe this time around, you know, that the, the, the tides are shifting, you know, you're getting, uh, you know, movement of more business to India. You have uh, the country investing in infrastructure and development. And so I'm really um, optimistic about the long-term prospects for, for India. Um, so it was one of the few places where I said, uh, you know, if you look at surface level PEs or multiples in the country, I'm willing to hang on because I think the prospects are so good three, five, and 10 years from now. So basically you sat through the pandemic fall and rode the rise again? A lot more too. So. That, that's pretty gutsy. <laughs> well, I mean, just you have phenomenally good companies. I, I don't know if you remember, but when everyone was in a panic, I think it was during the second lockdown, we actually held tight and said, you know, and said, maybe this will be finally an opportunity to increase our stakes. So um, we like to do what others aren't doing. It's, it's easier said, it's tougher to do. I know that from practical experience. You know, you've also said that bull markets only teach bad lessons. What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I stole that from a, a, another great investor, Howard Marks, um, you know, uh, you know, it's we've been in a narrative environment for the last few years where people haven't been looking at the actual fundamentals of the companies. They've just been buying stories. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it's one of the big, this last few years, I think has been one of the biggest bubbles uh, in, in markets I've seen in, in, in my history anyway. So uh, it doesn't teach you to roll up your sleeves and actually look at how good the businesses are. And I think pe people are being forced to do that now. So, um, yeah, it's um, it, it teaches you that make you know, making money is easy uh, when it's not. Are you still afraid that the Fed will keep raising rates, or will they blink at some point? I think they can. I, last week's speech by Jerome Powell was his best. I mean, he he finally took inflation seriously and let the markets know uh, that he took inflation seriously. I mean, the economy here has. Again, you have certain sectors of the economy here cooling, like the tech sector, which in my book was so overheated. I mean, it had 12 years of free money, so it was just incredibly overheated. Um, that's not necessarily fully recessionary. What is hot here is the services economy. It is hot, 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 and that that has to give. Uh, we're seeing incredible food, food price inflation here. So uh, I, he's got to take this seriously. He's got to break it, or it's going to be worse in the long run. Yeah, it's like what Paul Volcker did, perhaps, you know, take the medicine, set the economy right. Uh, but <clears throat> that's too serious. What we do, Laura, in the show is we do a rapid fire round to try and get a snapshot of my uh, guest. And I think you'll be a perfect candidate for that because there's so much varied interest. So I'm going to ask you questions. First thing that comes to your mind, shoot out, right? John Templeton or Jim Rogers, better for emerging markets? Templeton style Rogers books. Rogers books are phenomenal. An emerging market leader that gets it. I think, you know, I'll go country, Vietnam. The North Asian model for development is phenomenal. Is it following the East Asian model of the 60s? It is and 70s? following the East Asian model, you know, low cost manufacturing, 
you know, high priority uh, based on education and then go up the value chain. Lovely. Would you rather buy semiconductor stocks or oil stocks for a period of three years? Oh, this is a tough one. I mean, se I think semiconductors, but I don't think we're done yet with the earnings coming down. Okay. A Republican or Democratic, who would make a better president for the markets in 2024? Normal Republican, normally, but you know, with inflation, I don't know if tax cuts are gonna, gonna be what the market wants to hear. Okay. Happens the best the country you would, yeah. <laughs> so you visited 75 countries. Which is the best country to visit as a tourist? As a tourist? This one's hard. Um, I'll go South Africa. South Africa. Lovely country. Yeah, lovely safaris, lovely uh, landscape. Great. Uh, an investment book that is your Bible? Intelligent investor. Benjamin Graham. Ben Graham. Defensive investor chapter is still, it covers quality, it covers value. It's a phenomenal book. Lovely. And an in Indian investor that you're familiar with, can you name anyone that you're familiar with? M Monish Fabrai. Yeah, he's out in uh, Irvine County, I think. He's uh, also very bullish on India at this time. He's more deep value than me, but uh, I, I appreciate his, his, his uh, you know, Lovely. style. Moving on, an Indian CEO whom you met and admired. You know, it's, not, it's, a, it's more a team a management team, and it's Mariko. Uh, and I've never seen a CFO so passionate about his product. Harsh Maribala and his team, right? Yes. Lovely. Exactly. Uh, Amazing. Uh, a basketball game with the Utah Jazz, which is your local team, or an IPL game, what would you rather watch? You know, it, 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 cricket, but, but the games are long and it's really hot. <laughs> the the five-day version is long. The IPL is three hours. It's like a base basketball it still, game. It, it's still long. It's still long, but I would rather see cricket. Yes, okay. Um, <laughs> the final question, because I know you're a Japanophile. Would you rather go see sakuras or cherry blossoms, climb Mount Fuji, or soak in the onsen, which is a Japanese spa? What would you do if you had a weekend free in Japan? I've done the, all three of those things. They're all phenomenal, but I would ride a train in the middle of nowhere. Uh, there, there are some of these trains that no one gets on um, and they're just wonderful. So it's South Island, blue snow country. Um, it's a lovely weekend though. Just out of curiosity, they also have seven star luxury trains. Have you done them in Japan? I've always I thought that'd be good. You know, the, as you know, probably know the line for those was, you know, the favor went to the local the favor, the favors went to the locals first. So the line to get on one of those was, was extremely long. It was, a, you know, and expensive. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Laura, but you there know, are very cheap ones through the center of Kyushu that are just phenomenal. You know? Yeah, I love the name of your firm, Ronjur uh, Advisors. How did you get that name? Uh, it, it was from a Walt Whitman poem. It's called Passage to India. Oh, vast around here is swimming in space. Uh, it's about the world, uh, you know, and, and, and the globe. And, and Ronjo means really spherical happening. or globe, right? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I did my yeah. homework on you. I know you like Walt Whitman. And one of his other quotes is, we convince by our presence. And certainly you've convinced us by your presence on our show today. Thank you so much, Laura, for being part of our show on Wizards. Thank you so much for your time. Have a, have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week on another episode of The Wizards of the Street. I'm Ramesh Damani, wishing you a very happy week ahead. Goodbye.